Spider-Man cautioned us, with great power comes great responsibility. We now live in an era where efficient genome editing, such as the one that created Spider-Man, is not possible thanks to CRISPR. We have the power to fundamentally change our human race and the ecosystem for good or for bad. So you may wonder, what is CRISPR? And what are the uses and potential misuse of this powerful technology? Think of a define and replace function in a word processor. CRISPR is a, a genetic find and replace function, which allows you to search the genome for a target sequence and replace it with a, any desired sequence. And so with that, we have the power to create designer cells which can go and fight cancer, or we can even create designer babies. We have the power to genetically modify an entire species in an ecosystem using a CRISPR technology called as gene drives. For example, you can genetically vaccinate mosquitoes so that they no longer carry deadly pathogens. You can also genetically modify plants or food crops in a matter of weeks, which previously used to take decades, and the result is better nutrition, greater sustainability, and improved resistance to diseases. We also have the power to evolve certain species so that they can adapt to the climate change. And all of these amazing discoveries have happened within the short span of last 10 years. The rapid pace of these discoveries, as well as the potential impact, may seem pretty scary uh, to many. Because while we all agree that CRISPR has provided some of the game-changing technologies, it has also raised a lot of really serious questions. For example, how do we prevent crossing the line from improving human health to creating designer humans, which is as I hope you agree, can be unethical and can be very dangerous. How do we prevent off-target editing, which in many cases can have unforeseen consequences and can permanently damage our gene pool? And then there are political and ethical questions. How do you make sure that this powerful technology is available to everyone? On the other hand, if you make this powerful technology available to everyone, then how do we keep it out, out of the hands of bioterrorists? What if someone decides to create mosquitoes which bear toxins and spread them in the, in the wild using a gene drive technology? There are no simple answers to any of these complex questions. But now is the time for us to grapple with it and place appropriate safeguards while you still have the power. I'm not saying that we should stop CRISPR technologies. I'm just saying that sometimes it's worthwhile listening to our superheroes. It's the time we practice that great responsibility that comes with the great power. And as we have done in the past with powerful technologies, we need to place appropriate safeguards by building controllers and countermeasures to the CRISPR technologies. At the heart of a CRISPR technology is this enzyme called Cas9, which searches the genome and cuts the DNA. And the control of this enzyme over multiple dimensions like dose, time of action, or site of action is extremely important. In toxicology, they like to say that dose makes the poison, and that is particularly important for Cas9 for multiple reasons. At a high dose, Cas9 will cause chromosomal translocation. And that means that a bits of a one chromosome gets cut and get attached to a different chromosome, and that can completely mess up with the cell's genome. At a high dose, Cas9 causes genotoxicity, where cells can become cancerous. A prolonged activity of Cas9 leads to a lot of off-target effects, which again can be very dangerous. In embryo editing, a long-lived Cas9 leads to something what you call as mosaicism, where different cells in the body 
has got a completely different genome sequence. For example, the CRISPR babies born in China, they are likely mosaic, and we still do not understand the fundamental consequences of that mosaicism. Now, Cas9 is a bacterial protein. And if you're thinking of using it as a therapeutic, it cannot live long in our body because our immune system will have an adverse reaction. So keeping all of these in mind, we decided roughly four or five years ago that we need to build in some kind of controls and countermeasures. And we were thinking that we should build a dial by which we can switch on or switch off Cas9 and so that we can deliver the Cas9 in just the right amount and at just for the right time to get the precise edits. Now, precision controllers of an enzyme, they need to meet some criteria. The first is that they should be small so that they can get into the cells by themselves. They need to be stable in the body. They should not evoke an immune response. They should be easy to use, and they should be inexpensive. Now, that may seem like a really tall order, but there is one class of agents that meet all these criteria, and those are small molecules. So these tiny chemicals, which are roughly 400 times smaller than Cas9, can be used as a controllers. And so we decided to focus on them. Now, because they are really small, they're packing a lot of punch in a very small footprint. So that's really cool. But identifying these molecules is going to be extremely challenging as a chemist. And luckily, we have succeeded in identifying small molecules which can inhibit, or which can shred, or which can even activate Cas9 whenever we want it at whatever time frame. And so we started by first identifying the small molecule inhibitors of Cas9. Now, for Cas9, this enzyme to function, it needs to do two things. First, it has to bind to the DNA, and the target sequence that where we want to do the editing, and then it needs to cut the DNA. And so what we did is that we built a platform focusing on either DNA binding or on the cutting, so we built two platforms. And both of these platforms are scalable, they're in inexpensive, and they're quite rapid, allowing us to test around a million molecules at a very small cost. And so what these platforms gave us were first examples of small molecule inhibitors of Cas9. These small molecule inhibitors work either by preventing the DNA binding or they jam up the structural changes that lead to the Cas9 activity. These are first examples of anti-CRISPRs which can get into the cells by themselves. They're stable in human plasma. They do not evoke immune response. And using these molecules, we were able to reversibly switch on or switch off Cas9. In other words, we were able to shut down Cas9 whenever we wanted. And it was not just that. It was not just switching off Cas9. We were able to switch it off in such a way that the off-target activity, we were able to reduce it roughly by 700%. Now, that's just one of the applications in the mammalian system. But if you look at CRISPR, CRISPR is a defense system used by many disease-causing pathogens. And so using these inhibitors, we were able to selectively kill these pathogens. And that opened a door to a completely new class of antibiotics. But we didn't just stop with the inhibitors. We really wanted to shred Cas9 with a tiny little small molecule. And again, as I said, it's because if you want to use Cas9 as a therapeutic, it cannot really live long. So Cas9 has been shown to be active for almost 160 days in mice, and that's too long. And using our small molecules, we were able to shred it, or we were able to bring the half-life to as low as 30 minutes. So I told you about inhibitors and the shredders, but what about molecules which will allow you to switch on the activity of Cas9 at just the right time? 
And so we were able to design Cas9 enzymes, which are made in the cells, but they get rapidly chewed up by the cell's proteasomal machinery. And it's only when you add these small molecules that the Cas9 activity switches on in a very dose-dependent fashion. And so using these small molecules, we were able to switch on or switch off gene drives. And so what is this technology? What is this gene drive technology that people talk about? So if you look at a normal Mendelian inheritance, so the normal gene inheritance, there's a 50% chance of passing a gene to the progeny. Each copy, each, each progeny gets one copy from one parent. And that 50% barrier limits the rapid spread of a gene in a population. What CRISPR-based gene drives allow you to do is basically breach this 50% barrier and make it 100%, so you can just rapidly spread a gene in a population. And so using our technology, we were able to not only switch on or switch off these, but we were able to rapidly dial uh, how much of activity or how much of uh, inheritance from 50% or 100% you want. Now, the use of these controllers to switch on or switch off Cas9 is pretty relatively easy to see in a small mall or in an organismal setting. But you may wonder, how are you ever going to use these controllers, small molecules, to, say, control a mosquito in the wild? I mean, will you need airplanes spraying small molecules all over the world? And so the answer is no. One of the things I learned up growing up in India is that you don't have to go after mosquitoes the mosquitoes come to you. So this is a photo of my home in India. And you know we were basically surrounded by drains buzzing with mosquitoes all the time. But my siblings or I, we never had any or suffered from any mosquito-borne disease. And so we may ask, why? How did that miracle happen? Well, most of the slum-like neighborhoods like these use a very simple, small molecule device. When we don't have electricity, we use this. And we have electricity, use this. And these small molecules are dispersed in the, in the homes. And these are field-tested platforms that actually work and work really well. So a lot of our controllers can be, uh, the CRISPR controllers can be co-opted for these uh, control of mosquito or gene drive mosquitoes, I think. So I told you about that we have developed these small molecule activators, inhibitors, and, and, and shredders of, of Cas9. And so you may, answer, you may ask, what's next? Well, all these are first generation technologies which work really well in the lab setting. And so we are trying to make these next generation which will actually work in a real life setting. And we are focusing on very specific therapeutic settings. We are focusing on germline editing. And we are focusing on, on gene drives. And keeping these applications in mind, we are prioritizing controllers which are low cost, which are widely accessible, and which will be really potent. Because everyone on this planet deserves to benefit from this powerful technology in safety and in confidence. Thank you.